The following show is brought to you in part by support from Robbins, Kaplan, Miller, and Cerisi. We don't just practice law, we make history. Online at rkmc.com. And Wells Fargo. Let us help you reach your next stage. Additional support provided by Douglas M. Baker, Sr. of the Legacy Center. Hello and welcome. Delighted to introduce you tonight to one of Minnesota's leaders, Chuck Denny. Many of you probably know Chuck from his years as CEO and Chairman of the Board of uh, ADC Telecommunications or from his work at Honeywell, but he now told me that he describes himself as a volunteer, a community volunteer, and he is doing all kinds of wonderful things in that realm. Um, you're working almost full-time, Chuck, you just told me, with the Alzheimer's Association of Minnesota and the Dakotas as interim co-executive director. director, right? Exactly. And this is a organization you have a lot of passion for and have supported through the years. Well, I have because my wife is an Alzheimer's victim. So I have a deep abiding interest in providing the services of the Alzheimer's chapter to families who are in need of help, education, counseling. So it's a very worthwhile cause. It's a wonderful organization. If people don't know about it, it's based here in Bloomington or on the Bloomington Edina mm -hmm. line and um, wonderful resource for our area. But with offices so. in Rochester, Duluth, Fergus Falls, and Fargo, as well as Rapid City, South Dakota. So we serve a three-state area in which there are probably 140,000 people affected by Alzheimer's disease. And if you multiply- In three-state area? In a three-state area. Mm. And a number that's growing very, very quickly because it's a disease associated with the elderly. And of course, our population is aging. Mm -hmm. So we'll see more and more people. Right now, it's estimated that there are about 4 million people in the United States with Alzheimer's. And at the rate of increase that's currently occurring, in about 15 years, there'll be 14 million people suffering from Alzheimer's, mm -hmm. unless some cure is found. And at this point, there is no cure, which is there's no um, cure yet. Devastating news when when people are told about this. How long has uh, your wife had Alzheimer's, or how long have you known about it? Well, that's always a difficult question for Alzheimer caregivers it is, because I know. there are two dates. One is when the patient is officially diagnosed and that occurred in 1996. But then the family can retrospectively look back and begin to see changes in behaviors that uh, presaged the advent of the disease. And I think that all began in the late uh, 80s. So quite a few years where there were some subtle little yes, there were changes, changes occurring. going on. Um, we'll talk more about your family later. Besides doing this uh, wonderful work with the Alzheimer's Association right now, you're also on the advisory board of the Humphrey Institute oh, yeah. at the University of Minnesota, and you're trustee with the Minneapolis Foundation. So when you think of retirement, you are not very retired, are you? Well, I think I really am, except for working full time at the, at the <laughs> Alzheimer's Association, but that's only to be an interim a job term of thing. eight months or mm -hmm, so. Mm -hmm. And then I can go back to being an indolent loafer again. <laughs> so. um, let's go way back for a while and then we'll come back to, to um, the current time. Um, you were born and grew up where, Chuck? I don't even In know. In Minneapolis, Minnesota. Okay. And I was educated here, left for college. Went returned to Stanford. After at Stanford and returned after the service to work for my family's company, which I did for two years, and then I went to work for Honeywell for 11. 
and then uh, I went to work for ADC. For ADC, mm -hmm. which was then called Magnetic Controls, but subsequently was renamed ADC. Tell us in a sentence what ADC Telecommunications does or did. Um, people I know know the name, and yet people have asked me, well, what do they manufacture? Well, what do first they of all, nobody ever understands what ADC stands for. When it was first used, was in the mid-30s, and it stood for Audio Development Company. Mm -hmm. which was a very high-tech name at that point in yes, time. Yes, I bet. Uh, but over time, it became not high-tech at all. It was very commonplace. Uh, we revived it in the 80s because our products had always carried that as a trade name. And the products principally are sold to telephone operating companies, so to Quest mm -hmm. or Southern Bell or New York Tel, or to large private networks, people who have their own major communication systems. And they assist in the testing, the alignment, the transmission, and the interconnection of various communication devices. Okay, and now that's they're sold all over the world. Mm -hmm. And you really brought that company to its peak and um, did amazing things in your time. Well, with I them. wouldn't say I took it to its peak, but I took it along the road as it marched mm -hmm. out of bankruptcy, where it was mm -hmm. when I first joined it and small, about $6 million. And we were able to grow the revenues and to expand the operations and to gain uh, satisfied customers over the 21 years I was there. So we gave it at least a good start and we did take it into telecommunications where it resides today. I um, enjoyed, Chuck has written a book and it's not out um, no. on all the bookshelves, but it's a wonderfully interesting book. And in that book you describe um, the early days, very early days with ADC when you were really contemplating having to close uh, uh, the big plant down in St. Peter. Yes. And I mean it was... Nip and tuck. Nip and tuck in the strongest sense of the term, wasn't it? It really was. It was a thrill a day. Mm -hmm. We never knew if the doors would be open the next morning. It was a tough time because the recession was so deep, the 69-71 recession caught the company totally unprepared. And without uh, any warning, we were suddenly on the verge of bankruptcy, and technically we're bankrupt. But our major shareholder, bless his soul, stepped in and guaranteed our debt, which gave us a couple of years to turn the company about, which we managed to do. The economy returned, and from there, it was all upward and onward. Thank you, goodness. You and I were talking before the show started about your energy, and... Um, I asked Chuck if he had high energy, and I, I thought his answer would be yes, which it was, but um, did, it, did that high energy carry you through a lot of those early tough days, do it you think, in a way did. that... Because we were working 78-hour weeks. Mm -hmm. You would really? work sometimes seven days during the course mm -hmm. of a week, and the, every day was a long, long day. The pressure was intense, the activity was fervent, you were exhausted at the end of every day, but if you have high energy level, as you know, because you have one, it returns in the morning. You're mm -hmm. a little sleep and you're ready to go again. <laughs> so thank goodness uh -huh. it was necessary. It's bode you well. <laughs> it did. Um, me. Your, your parents, what did they do? Did I, I know oh. worked for your family's company. Well, but... my mother and father were separated when I was 13, and so uh -huh. I was really raised by my mother and her bachelor brothers. And so when I refer to the family, I'm referring to my mother's family. Uh, the uncles were really surrogate parents for both my brother and for me. Uh, and uh, mother was a stay-at-home mother. Okay. Uh, but the uncles were engaged in a wide variety of activities, a propane gas company, iron ore mining investments of one sort or another. So, and we had a large family farm that was the family homestead, actually, from the 1860s hmm. that was in the family for years. Uh, that also took some time. So there was a wide variety of things to do and to learn. And you, as a young man, had a real variety of jobs. I mean, a I lot did. of manual labor, yes. working, digging ditches. Um, mm -hmm. Working on farms, driving truck. The, the boat, the yeah. years on the Crew Mississippi. Crew on a boat, yeah, that sounded was wonderful. Wonderful, It's yes. just what a little boy needs, you know, uh -huh. all of that, to drive a tractor, to drive a big boat. Do you think having that very, um, really rough physical kind of experience has given you some empathy, some insights, Chuck, into working um, 
through the years as a leader? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I uh, feel sorry for people who have not had an opportunity to work with all facets of society uh, in all different kinds of jobs. It, it used to be, in my time, which was a wondrous time, that the services, military service, was required uh, after college. And so that mixed all of us up together. And you did all kinds of things that you never would have done otherwise in team relationships. And so you had that chance to come to know all the stratas of society. We don't have that opportunity any longer. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to find it, you're going to have to do the kinds of things that I was lucky enough to do. It, it sounds to me from um, reading your book and, and talking to people about you that you have been, as a leader, quite democratic, wanting to get people from all levels pulled into decision making. Um, am I right? Does that describe how you? That's my preferred you? mode of mm -hmm. operation mm -hmm. uh, because that's the way I would like to be treated. And I was treated from time to time when I was at Honeywell where your opinions were valued and your contributions were valued. You had something to say that was of use to those who were above you. And if they gave you that opportunity and had confidence in you and, and used whatever it is that you could contribute, uh, that developed you, made the team stronger, and it makes the leader far more successful. Mm -hmm. What do you think, when you use the word success, what do you think has made you as successful as you've been? What characteristics about Chuck Denny have um, kind of gotten you to the leadership roles you've had? Well, I think certainly a lot of good fortune, good luck to be in the right place at the right time when opportunities were present. Uh, I have friends who are far smarter than I, who have worked harder than I, and who have enjoyed less material success. They're very successful in other ways, but their luck was bad. And there is such a thing as good luck and bad luck. Mm -hmm. I do think I was blessed with high energy. And uh, as you and I had chatted, I also have had a very durable physical physique. Mm -hmm. I'm not sick. Uh, I'm never knocked down for long. Uh, I'm always able to get back up again. And so I think that was very important. And I think I've always had an idea of where I wanted not myself to go, but uh, any team that I was leading mm -hmm. or a company, mm -hmm. what the future would be. A and vision. A vision, somehow or other, and being able to communicate that to those with whom I worked. Mm -hmm. And I, so I think all of those things made it possible. That's no small task to communicate your vision. Mm -hmm. um, James Shannon talked about that with me, and I think that um, it's easily stated, but, but carried out in lots of different ways that are pretty complex, right, Chuck? Well, it has to have meaning to the audience. It can't be just meaningful to the leader. It's often said the best vision statements arise out of the corporate group, that is, the corporate body. And I think that's true, but usually you need to have some general top-down, at least framing, mm -hmm. within which then everyone else makes their inputs. Uh, if you have that, then the communication is very easy because you're returning to the choir the song that they themselves mm -hmm. wrote. Mm -hmm. And that really then produces very harmonious and powerful music. Uh, so it's that ability to somehow engage everybody in a common vision that is important, as important to them as it is to you. Have you had a mentor, or did you have a mentor in your early days that gave you some insights into these kinds of principles, really? I've often thought about mentors, and as you know, I'm in a men's group, and we often talk about mentoring mm -hmm. and those who mentored us. And I look back, and, and I was very fortunate uh, that I had, uh, in my youth, I had my uncles, bachelor mm -hmm. uncles, who were bigger than life, and so mm -hmm. they were heroes, and you looked up to them, uh, very competent and very caring individuals. In high school, I had the dean of studies, who was a special friend and a mentor. Mm -hmm. In college, I lived with the dean of men, and was a recipient of incredible mentoring from him. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a Commodore in the United States Navy who was a friend of the family who took me under his wing uh, whilst I was in college as he lived in the area. Mm -hmm. uh, so I had 
wonderful mentors in that respect. So many mentors too. Many, you know, at different stages in life. Uh -huh. But I think there's also the issue of role models as well as mentors. Mentors mm -hmm. to me mean somebody who takes that extra time, there's a deep personal connection, mm -hmm. it's an right. ongoing relationship. Right. But role models can even be people that you've never That's even true. met. You might just read about them or read about them see and admire them, them and mm -hmm. try to emulate. And there are people here in the community, people like Charlie Bell of General Mills mm. and Sandy Bemis of the Bemis Company and certainly the Dayton brothers who taught so many of us wonderful lessons about being involved in the community. Just, you know, in gifted, gifted individuals who directed and led us into doing much of what we subsequently did. That's so yes, I have those. important differentiation and no one else has made that, Chuck. I'm glad to um, have you make the differentiation between role models and mentors. When you think of the hard things you've gone through um, in terms of work, and you've gone through some tough things. Um, one of the periods of Chuck's life that we won't have much time to go into, but he lived in France, and there was a period in France when strikes were imminent and um, you were in danger of having to shut down everything. Um, but one of your Minnesota friends said that he thought perhaps the hardest time, um, and you might agree or disagree with this, was when you really stood out and stood up and said, I think CEOs are being paid too much here in Minnesota and I want to kind of go public about that. And people didn't really like to hear that, did no, they? No, they didn't. Would you say that was one of the tough? That wasn't hard at all, as a matter of fact, oh, no. Interesting. Because I felt so deeply about the subject. And uh, while I'm sure I irritated a number of acquaintances, uh, I never wounded any of my good friends because they were not engaged in taking unusually egregiously high salaries. Mm -hmm. So I kept my friends and I might have irritated some people that I didn't intend to. But I do believe so strongly that if we are in the business world going to correct so many of the problems that we're facing today, then it is uh, incumbent on us to speak out when we see practices that we find abhorrent. Too often we just uh, keep it to ourselves for fear we're going to offend people. Mm -hmm. And we don't want to do that. And particularly if you're from Minnesota and you're Minnesota nice, mm -hmm. you never do that. <laughs> but that allows people to believe that their behaviors are endorsed by your very silence. Mm -hmm. Acquiescence. So I think mm -hmm. speaking out is necessary and you just, I will often believe, you know, if, if you have been lucky enough to, to, to build any kind of a reputation, whatever it is, that you have a, a, a duty almost to spend that reputation, to draw it down, to, to, to use it to accomplish something of good. So that when you go to your grave, your reputation has been totally used up mm. and you return to the earth from whence you came, as you came. So by spending it, giving it back to the community? Use it, if it's, it'll help you speak out with a message, even mm -hmm. though it chips away at your reputation, you do it. Mm -hmm. So being true to yourself, yes. saying what, what is on your mind. I just heard, um, I believe his name is Andrew Grove, yes. the CEO For of Intel. Intel. And he was being interviewed by Charlie Rose and he said, these days it's almost embarrassing to be a CEO because of Enron. And um, do you have some of those feeling sometimes when you look back on well, your CEO days? Well, I think we've gone through some unusual phases of management leadership in this country. There were the days back in the 1800s when the business moguls were the robber barons par excellence. And then we got religion under Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, but then there was great war profiteering during World War I. And then we had some reforms and finally in the Great Depression. Uh, we found again that business leadership was lacking seriously and so we had some more government reforms. And I think we're just going through another one of those waves now. Uh, History does put things in perspective, doesn't it? Does, it? Yes, and it does yes. have a way of repeating itself mm -hmm. because we're talking about human behavior and no one has ever figured out how to permanently correct human behavior. So we just sort of have to come up with better systems. Uh, the head of the conference board recently noted that the public's disdain for corporate CEOs has reached a new low. They have never seen it this low since the conference board was founded in 1917. 
Wow. So it says a lot about how seriously <laughs> we have damaged the public's credibility in our leadership. Mm -hmm. And it does make me embarrassed that it is only a handful of people who have done this. Mm -hmm. But the rest of us could have taken action earlier and we failed to do so. So we bear the same guilt. We didn't do it, but we didn't prevent it. Chuck, when I ask you what your greatest challenge was, I gave you an idea, you said that was easy. Let's go back to that question. What was the toughest thing as a leader that you dealt with? In terms of leadership, I think they were identical two incidences in my life. One was when I went to France, the subsidiary, which I then became the, the head of. This was connected to Honeywell. It was Honeywell subsidiary, mm -hmm. Honeywell's company in France, about 1,200 people, <laughs> had become very discouraged. The morale was very, very poor, and the performance was poor. Uh, it was almost an article of faith in Honeywell that you could never make money in France because after all those Frenchmen drink wine at lunch, that sort of thing. <laughs> and my job was to somehow or other restore or instill confidence in those wonderful people and allow them to encourage them, enable them to live up to the full level of their own competence. And when they did, they just did wonderful and marvelous things. And I could just sit back, mm -hmm. put my feet up on the desk and say, oh, isn't that great? And it happened again when I came to ADC. They had enjoyed 10 years of failure. They didn't believe they could do a single thing right. They thought they were going to go out of existence momentarily. Uh, it was about as discouraged a bunch of people as I've ever encountered in my life. And my job again was to somehow or other give them the vision, give them a reason for trusting in themselves to rebuild their own confidence and develop their competencies, which they had and we literally took people who, when I first was there, I thought were utter failures and probably we should have gotten rid of, but we kept them and we worked on them and they became leaders of the company. And I bet they felt extremely um, grateful to you for not letting them go. I'm sure they, uh, oh, in I, one I, way, knew they were I could never on speak the for edge. them, but mm -hmm. I'm grateful that we didn't you let them go. kept them on. Yeah. It's interesting that it worked so well as it did in France with you being an American and your language skills were good, it sounds like, but probably you missed a few oh, I you missed know, a nuances. Lot. Oh, yes. Um, that's, I'd had to start that's learning a greater French. challenge, I would think, even than, than the ADC group. Well, the language issue was difficult. Sure, that would be. But you can communicate with, I suppose, body language, demeanor, mm -hmm. carriage, your confidence, and in how you respond to people, you evidence your belief in them. Mm -hmm. Even if it's just a smile, or a how do you do in whatever language, or, you know, well done. Mm -hmm. If you can say just that much and give people that kind of encouragement, it almost always happens that they'll become larger than they were before. And how exciting for you to see that oh, yes. kind of result. Um, Chuck, when I look at your resume and see the things that you have done in the past, Chairman of the Board of Trustees of the College of St. Catherine, Chairman and Founder of the Minnesota High Tech Council, Director of the Boys and Girls Club, uh, Director of the Minnesota Center for Corporate Responsibility, on and on. Um, how did you balance all your outside duties with keeping your family going? And you had three children three and children. a wife that wasn't always healthy. That's true. Um, certain periods. Um, how did, do you feel you did balance it in a way that worked for you and your family? I hope I did. You would have to ask my children that question, <laughs> I think. I was busy, uh, but I always tried to limit. I did things, but over many years, and so that's just an accumulated sure, list of sure. 30 years or 35 years in the community. I always try to limit the amount that I did so that it didn't interfere with family life. And when my wife was ill, then I wouldn't engage in civic activities. I would drop out or lay off appreciably until my wife was well. So you worked at Say No. Yes. And it sounds like that I never learned to you. do that well. But <laughs> my daughter always says no is a 
one word sentence and I have to learn how to do it. <laughs> so I don't say no, to, well, but I always look at things and say, are they worthwhile? Mm. That's the key question yeah. for checked in. It are is. they worthwhile? Yeah, is it something you could contribute to? Mm -hmm. um, we have two minutes left, Chuck. In terms of helping young people develop their own leadership, um, do you have any words for them or for people working with them? Um, it sounds like you had some real intuitive ways of bringing people's leadership to the, the fore. Um, can you verbalize how you did well, that? Well, I don't know that I did anything special, but I, I do think that it's really important that we as a society find ways in, in grade school, in high school, in college, in the early job years to provide leadership opportunities to our young and up and coming adults. And through that, and with constant positive feedback, allow them to prove to themselves that they have that capability. Mm -hmm. And it is not for everyone to be a leader. That's a good point. And to learn that mm -hmm. is an outstanding lesson to learn early on in life. You can do very well in this world without being a leader. That's mm -hmm. just for some, some people. Some are not suited and would exactly. hate it. And, and some mm -hmm. of the greatest contributors to society are people who are not leaders. Mm -hmm. They're individual performers. Mm -hmm. And they have given us the great scientific breakthroughs, the great literature, the music, the art. These are not necessarily leaders. That's a very, another interesting differentiation. Yeah. Did you feel, and we have a few seconds left, did you feel early on though that you were a leader? Did you have that sense I don't as know a that boy? I had that sense as a child, uh, but I think it came to me as I began to work. Well, Chuck Denny, you certainly are a leader and an esteemed one in our community. Thank you so much. Mary, for thank you. Coming down Wonderful and to be here. sharing your ideas and some of your life. I've been talking to Chuck Denny. Thank you for being with us. We'll be back again next week. Until then, have a good week.